Hi, my name is John Horgan. I'm a science writer. I teach at Stevens Institute of Technology, and I've been yammering about science and related stuff on uh, Meaning of Life TV and Blogging Heads TV. And now I have my own um, little niche called Mind Body Problems for a really long time now. And uh, it's, it's really fun because basically I just try to find people that it would be fun to talk to whether or not we were being recorded. And, uh, you know, we just shoot the shit for a while. So with me today is one of my favorite scientists and, and people. I've only met you a couple of times, but uh, I have great admiration uh, for you. Sabina Hassenfelder, um, a German physicist uh, who has really strong opinions about uh about physics. Um, and I, you know, I just have to say that uh, you're, I, you know, uh, I th- you're so good for physics. You're so good for science in general. I really, I really believe that even though you say some things that I find outrageous that upset me. Uh, so, you know, we can get into some of that today, but um, I'm going to let you talk eventually, but let me say one more thing first. Uh, I have been for more than a year now, immersed in quantum mechanics trying to understand it and it's your fault you you released a video in may last year uh you said you know you've got these fantastic videos they've made you like an internet sensation um and uh this one you said okay i'm going to explain the difference between um entanglement and superposition and I, i you know i saw i saw that teaser and i thought Damn, I've always wondered about that. Okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch this. I'm going to understand the difference between entanglement and superposition. And so then I watched it, and it was like, I don't know, 10 or 12 minutes long. And I thought, wow, that, you know, that's, that's pretty brief to cover these very deep, deep difficult concepts. And I'm, I'm like with you, I'm with you for, I don't know, maybe 90 seconds or two minutes. And then suddenly, bam, I hit a wall, as I kind of expected I would. And I didn't really understand. You, you introduced a couple of technical terms and a little bit of math, as I recall. And I, I was lost. And I've had this feeling over and over again. You know, I've been writing about physics for like 30 years now and uh, without understanding the mathematics and, and the, the sort of technical int- intricacies. And for some reason, this morning, it bothered me. It really bothered me. And I decided, also all my summer plans had been dashed because of the pandemic. And I decided I'm going to learn quantum mechanics. So I don't have to take the word of all these smarty pants, like my friend Sabina about what's really going on. So I've been doing it for, yeah, like, I don't know, 15 months now. Um, So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I'm actually working on a book on it now. Um, The other other members of the physics community might say they might not want to thank you. They might say it's your fault that we have another stupid John Horgan book inflicted on us now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, welcome. How, so how are you doing? And what have you been up to lately? Well, first of all, apologies uh, that uh, you found my video somewhat incomprehensible. Uh, In my defense, I have to say this is like part five of a series or something. So hopefully if you had actually started with the first part, it would have been a little bit more comprehensible. Uh, But yeah, I mean, so every once in a while I show an equation um, and I do this because personally, um, I think if you don't actually show the math, uh, you'll never really understand it. Um, so I'll be curious to uh, to see what's in your book. <laughs> if you came to the same conclusion, if uh, you think in the end that you can do it with words, uh, if you use sufficiently many words, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's all well, that 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 in a way that's kind of what the book is about: the degree to which you can or cannot translate from mathematics into ordinary language. Um, and I, I we're going to get into that. Uh, because this topic actually comes up in a book that you are writing now. And, you know, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. So 
can you just like give us a little bit of the background on um on the book yeah so you're the first person to actually read the book uh, except for my editor, uh, who uh-huh. kind of has to read it. And, uh, you know, my husband and my mother are <laughs> stuck somewhere in the middle. <laughs> but they, 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 I hope they will get there eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, so and this is the first time I'll be talking about it. So I, I'm a little bit afraid there will be some stuttering and some uh, I'm not really exactly sure I want to say this. <laughs> so uh, bear um, with me. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. And uh, I have to, to start practicing this uh, somehow. Uh, so the book is called uh, More Than This. Uh, and yes, I know there's a song uh, with the same name and so on and so forth. Um, and I think my main message uh, with the book was to say physics is more than, you know, just balls rolling down inclined planes or fundograph generators and that kind of thing. For me, physics has always been about trying to answer the really big questions about the universe. Uh, and uh, in this book, I take on what I think are those big questions. You know, other people might disagree what the big questions are, um, but those are like my big questions and that's stuff like does the past still exist can the universe think uh can there be galaxies inside every particle could there be copies of us uh out in the multiverse uh do we live in a computer simulation uh why doesn't anyone ever get younger uh that kind of thing and so every chapter is a question and then i do my best to answer the question but i think my main message is more that physics is a tool that allows you to address these questions and make headway on them. Yeah. I, first of all, let me say, I, you know, I'm a big fan of your writing. And so I loved your book because it, it sounds like you the whole way through and, <laughs> and, you know, and that's a gift. A lot of writers just don't have that. A lot of writers don't have a distinctive voice. You have a very distinctive voice and, and I think and it has a German accent. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. For some reason, I'm I'm the German accent comes through as I'm reading. Um, I'm picturing you, you know, saying these things. And part of it, part of the charm is that you just seem like you say exactly what you think, and that is not. You can't take that for granted. I think a lot of popular books. Uh, big time physicists, I think even Stephen Hawking did this in um, Brief History of Time, which kind of was is the template for popular books by physicists. There's like a soft peddling of the physics to a certain extent to make it sound a little bit more, I don't know, spiritual than it really is. A little bit more consoling and softer and uh your book has some consolation but you're very blunt also in dismissing certain things like you know free will which is something really important to me we're not i'm not going to bring that up yet but i <clears throat> i just want to say this is a characteristic of your writing this this kind of absolute bluntness and, and i i trust you to say what you mean um, in a way that I don't trust a lot of other scientist authors. Uh, But I want to start by taking up one of the big themes of your book that has puzzled me for a while. And it puzzles me more now because I've been studying quantum mechanics for the last year. It's determinism. Um, I don't, I still don't understand, even though you explained it. And I also, one of the books I've read is uh, Leonard Susskind's book on, on uh, quantum mechanics, which is, you know, has a lot of mathematics and it's much more technical than yours, but he's also adamant that quantum mechanics is deterministic. Our, our, the picture that physics gives us of the world is deterministic. And I don't understand how that can be the case when as you also acknowledge, quantum mechanics injects this element of randomness into at least our observations of the world. So how, how does that work? Well, 
Maybe we should first clarify what we mean by determinism. Okay. <laughs> I think that might be helpful. So um, if you take all the information you can possibly have uh, about the present moment uh, and uh, try to make a prediction for what happens in the future in a deterministic universe, um, you tell you can tell exactly what's going to happen. Theoretically, you know, in, in practice, there are always issues like that. You can't measure everything precisely. And then there's chaos and all that kind of thing. But if you just look at the math, um, the initial state determines what comes uh, later, which just means there is a map to that state in the future and you can calculate it in principle. Now, the peculiar thing about quantum mechanics is that it actually has two equations that tell you what's going to happen. And the first equation is, is the Schrödinger equation. And the Schrödinger equation is what we call an evolution law um, that just tells you, um, that just says that the evolution law tells you how the state changes in time. So you start with, with some initial state um, and then you apply the evolution law to it and, and that tells you what happens at any later time. And in, in a classical theory, that's the end of the story. You, you only have this evolution law and then you calculate what's uh, going to happen as good as you can. Now, in quantum mechanics, you have the second thing, which is the update of the wave function or sometimes called the collapse of the wave function or the reduction of the wave function is all the same thing. And that is not deterministic. And that basically tells you, um, you take this wave function and you use it to calculate the probabilities for certain measurement outcomes. For example, you know, where am I going to see the electron on the screen uh, or what's its spin or, you know, what's what's the energy of, I don't know, some excitations in an atom or something like that. Uh, and from the wave function, you can calculate the probability for getting a particular measurement outcome. But then, of course, when you measure it, <laughs> you don't get the probability, you just get the outcome. Yeah. And now the problem is that at this point, you need to update the wave function um, for it to say, now the particle or whatever it is that you measured is with 100% probability at this p position. And that's not deterministic. Um, you can have, there's a large variety of uh, initial wave functions that can all give you the same measurement result. And um, so when people say quantum mechanics is deterministic, um, they only refer to this uh, time evolution, the Schrodinger equation. And then there are the many worlds people who actually believe that this is the only thing you need. And I would, I would disagree. I think these people are just really, really confused. Well, you, but you, to me, what you describe, the situation you describe is still non-deterministic the, the schrodinger equation applies to the many worlds people would say it applies to the multiverse the multiverse evolves deterministically but in this universe we live in uh there is the the schrodinger equation only gives us the probability that a certain thing will happen that to me by definition is is deterministic i i don't want to belabor this point too much but am i i still feel like i'm missing something uh, so uh, I'm not sure I follow. You, th you think it is indeterministic or it is deterministic? It is not deterministic because exactly. when you make the yeah. measurement, you only get something that was predicted probabilistically by the Schrodinger equation. So how is that deterministic? That's what I it don't isn't. get. Oh, it okay. All right. Well, <laughs> You're so right. Uh, and, and I would disagree with everybody who says the opposite. What I thought, okay, so then in the beginning of your book, um, the first chapter, you talk about time and you introduce uh, what I would call, what actually Susskind calls the minus first law, which is basically inf information is conserved. And I thought that this is directly tied to a deterministic picture of the world. So maybe maybe you can just tell me about why some physicists, including yourself, I think, believe that information is um, conserved. So when I begin the book, I talk about 
the classical uh, deterministic evolution. That's mm -hmm. without quantum mechanics. And uh, then at, at the end of this chapter, I say, well, there are two loopholes to this. <laughs> and uh, the one loophole is black holes, uh, black hole evaporation more precisely. And the other one is the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Right. Uh, but I didn't want, you know, in the first chapter to throw everything at people. You know, I hate these books where you first have to read like 100 pages introduction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or you get to the thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I decided to first introduce the classical um, deterministic evolution and uh, figure out what we can learn from this. And then I talk about this random element that quantum mechanics brings in later. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I mentioned this in, in, in a short sentence or something. Uh, uh, so now I've forgotten the question. Oh, that the conservation of information. Oh, the, con the conservation of information. Yeah, so th the, the problem is that information is quite is a vague word. So I, I actually don't know exactly what Susskind may have been referring to. Uh, but the way that people usually talk about the preservation of information and the foundations of physics, the only thing they mean uh, is that the time evolution is reversible. Okay. So it's not it's not just deterministic in the sense that you can predict what's going to happen in the future. But if I gave you the thing in the future, you can't predict where it came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if if that's the case, then you could say, well, you know, if I can always calculate one one thing from the other, then the information in both is the same. And um, I know that people always get confused about exactly what you mean by information, but you actually don't need to know it. The only thing that information means in this context is the specification of the initial state, uh, wh whatever that is. It depends on what your theory is. Okay, but you make a very dramatic claim uh, at the end of that chapter that I would put in the category of a kind of consolation. And uh, you say that, and it's related to this question that you're asked at the beginning of the book by somebody who's asking whether his dead grandma is, is still alive in some sense. And at the end of this discussion of comfort, conservation of information, you say, yeah, you know, your grandma is preserved. She's immortal in a sense. Her information uh, is out there in the fabric of uh, the universe. And I, when I first encountered this idea of conservation of information, I was so struck by it, and, and it was in uh, Susskind, um, that I wrote a column about it, basically saying, like, bullshit, tell me another one, you physicists. <laughs> you call yourself atheist, but, you know, you're trying to make us feel better, and I don't buy it. Like, you know, my father died a year ago. So my father somehow lives on in the fabric of the universe. So I, is that, and that seems to be, you know, you're talking about a, a very kind of humanistic form of information there. So I guess I want to know, do you really believe that? That, you know, like everything is preserved somehow in the fabric of reality? Uh, yeah, I actually believe it. So, um, so as I discuss in uh, in the book, uh, there are two things that stand in the way that we know of. The one is the evaporation of black holes, um, which looks like it can destroy information. Like if you throw something into a black hole and and then it evaporates and only leaves behind this Hawking radiation, which is always the same if the black hole had the same mass, that looks like it's not time reversible. Uh, but um, so this is something which I've worked on for for, for a really long time. Um, I think most people who work in the field don't actually think that that actually happens. Um, y you always run into this problem that to really describe what goes on in in the ev evaporation of a black hole is you, you need a theory of quantum gravity, and we don't have one. Right. So really, no one knows. Um, right? I mean that that's like what, what I can say with confidence. Really, no one knows. Uh, but most people think that if we had this theory of uh, quantum gravity, it would be time reversible because all the other quantum theories that we know are also time reversible. And the other thing is the measurement uh, process in quantum mechanics itself, uh, 
uh, which, as we already um, discussed, is not deterministic and it's also not time reversible. So if you only have the final outcome, you don't know where it came from. And if that's actually really how nature works, um, then information is not preserved. Yeah. Um, but uh, I I don't think that this is really a fundamental process. I think it's just a you know a crutch that we've put into place that eventually it will be replaced by something else, something better, something more fundamental. Um, but yeah, so so those are the, the two things that you kind of have to buy if you uh, um, think that information is uh, preserved. Um, but yeah, I mean, then that's just what the laws of nature tell you. Uh, and uh, I, I agree uh, what you say, that this is a very spiritual um, point of view. Um, and uh, I sometimes think that, that physicists are not really aware of how big a consequence it really is. I, I, I totally agree with that statement. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, leaning more in that direction now than I was before, you know, my whole quantum project started. I want to like one other point I want to make about this um, conservation of information, which I found find so fascinating. Uh, by the way, Susskind sometimes equated it with the principle of uh, unitarity. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, unitarity is actually, it's a little bit more. So a, un a unitary transformation is time reversible. So, and that's the relevant property, but it also uh, is more than this because it um, also conserves probabilities. So you, you want to make sure that probabilities always add up to 100%. <laughs> Otherwise, quantum, mecha quantum mechanics doesn't really properly work. So the unitarity lumps these two things together. It's time reversible and it conserves probabilities. But for the information, the relevant part is that it's time reversible. So I've done a lot of thinking about conservation laws and, and um, you know, I've, I've also been reading Feynman in addition to Susskind and, and you, and, you know, so you're, you're in really, uh, you're in good company. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, that uh, some physicists think that the conservation laws are like the deepest truths. And that's why I'm so fascinated again by conservation of information, because to me, information the concept of information and i you know i've i've written about information theory which is invented by claude shannon back in the 1930s i you know information is used by john wheeler and is it from bit formulation uh, of quantum mechanics the concept of information presupposes consciousness or at least sentient observers who are packaging the information and sending it out and then receiving the information. Um, and so conservation, a corollary of conservation of information, it seems to me is conservation of consciousness. <laughs> and so it means, and again, if you're looking for consolation from physics, it seems to me that it's implying the consciousness, we don't have to worry about, being extinguished, Let, let's say not as individuals, but, you know, an asteroid strikes the earth and incinerates us. Well, you know, that's too bad for us, but consciousness is conserved in the universe as a whole. It's always been there. It always will be there. That sounds very romantic, but I think you've thrown together several definitions of information. So mm -hmm. the the information that people talk about when they say uh, information is pr preserved because uh, the time evolution is unitary uh, has nothing to do with this stricter um, definition of information that people use in some other um, areas. Um, and if you use these notions of information, and there are many different ones of them. For example, you, you can use certain notions of entropy. And I, I recently reviewed um, uh, a book from Kia Marletto about uh, constructor theory, um, the, the physics of can and can't, or something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she has another definition uh, of information. And if you take those notions of information, they wouldn't be conserved. Which is why I'm sometimes a little bit unhappy with this way to phrase things. And so if you're talking about consciousness, 
you know, it always comes down to what exactly do you mean by consciousness? And so for me personally, I would say consciousness has something to do with what happens. You know, it's not just about uh, can you reconstruct something, but it's actually about uh, what you can do. Um, and so from this physics perspective, you know, at the fundamental level, if you think about the unitary evolution, if someone dies, what happens is that um, all this information that's in the configuration, it just spreads out all over, you know, the planet, maybe over the universe in like teeny tiny correlations. So you can't really do anything with it. Uh, you can't talk to them anymore. Uh, we, we've all noticed this. Um so I, I I would be a little bit uncomfortable to say that the consciousness is still there. I would be comfortable to say, in principle, theoretically, an omniscient being could reconstruct it because it wasn't actually lost. Right. Um, I'm I'm just warning you. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have a whole section on on. Uh, conservation of consciousness as a consequence of, of unitarity. And yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm like trying to follow your ideas to their uh, completely crazy conclusions. Um, all right. you, you, you might want to have a look at uh, Marletta's book, how she defines information. I, I've actually forgotten. So I don't, if I try to remember it now, it will be terrible. <laughs> but we will have a look at the book. <laughs> okay. I, I think I read your, your review of it because it looked like it was about some of the ideas that are, that are uh, important to me. Um, all right. So I want to go on to, um, you know, the, the, maybe the, the, the main difference uh, between our worldviews, which is um, free will. And it seems to me free will, your view of free will is directly tied to um, your inclination to think that the universe is deterministic. So, I mean, can you just like give us a brief uh, description of your view of free will well the issue with free will is that it all depends on what you mean by the word right. and so what i did in my book was that i stated the problem without even referring to the word uh, free will and the problem is just that for all we currently know and this is like uh, you know pretty much everything i say starts with this phrase right um the fundamental laws of nature are deterministic except for uh this random element in quantum mechanics which we have no influence on and now whether you think that rules out free will or not depends on what you mean by free will I would just say free will is just an incoherent idea. I can't make sense of it. Uh, let's just forget about it and not use the word and find a better, more constructive way to think about what's happening. Oh, okay. Um, all right. I'll tell you what I mean by it. Um, uh, by I mean, um, it's an experience that all of us have. So... Um, I was, I don't know, whatever it was, like a week ago or so, I was uh, thinking about some of, uh, you know, the issues related to quantum mechanics. And I, and I thought, um, hey, it'd be fun to talk to Sabina about some of this stuff. I wonder if she'd be up for that. And so then I, I you know, and, and at that point, I had different options in my life. Uh, all of us at any moment have different things that we can do in, in the near future or the, the, you know, longer term future. And then I sent my bits through the internet to you, my little piece of information, and then you read it and then you had to make a choice yourself. So to me, it's, it's this experience that all of us have that we are constantly making decisions that alter the trajectory of our bodies as well as our minds in the future, right? That's what I mean by free will. And, and, and this is a really crucial point, and I think this distinguishes you from me. I think that our choices are not reducible 
to physics. They are not reducible to particles that are being pushed and pulled by various forces. There is a higher order of something happening that emerges from the particles. It's the psychological realm that, um, that creates this thing called choices or free will. I agree. Phil, free will is not the best term because I, I also accept that I'm a completely physical creature. I've got genes. I'm limited in all sorts of ways. I'm getting old. I'm going to die someday. You know, I can't fly. Um, I'm not free and I'm limited by my, my, um, my genes and the kinds of things I can think about. I, you know, and I can't understand like uh, gauge theory is too hard. Um, but within these constraints, I have all kinds of choices that are determined by my values, by what I want to do with my life. That's what I'm trying to defend. Well, I would say you, you think you have choices because you don't know what you will do. I mean, if you use a phrase like, I had different options of what I could do. You know, uh, when you were thinking about, uh, do you really want to talk to me or would you rather talk to someone else? Um, you thought you have different options, but you didn't. It's just incompatible with the laws of physics. And, you know, just by saying, well, I believe there's some higher realm and uh, it doesn't make the laws of physics uh, go away. Now, there are some people who, um, you know, like Rovelli and uh, Sean Carroll and, and so on, who um, have tried to, and, and, and what's the person with the, with the book, How Physics Makes You Free? I keep forgetting her name. It's, it's a strange name. It'll come back to me at some point. Oh, um, Fazillin or Fazillin or something like that? Anyway, okay, go. No, yeah. some, it's something, Ish, Ishmael or something. So it's... Yeah. Yeah. So um, whatever. Uh, and so, so what, what they are trying to do is they are trying to find a definition of free will on an emergent level. Right. And you, you can do this if you want. I mean, it's not wrong, but it doesn't change anything about the fact that the future was already determined up to some quantum random events that you couldn't influence because nothing can influence them. That, and, and that just, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, for, for, for being the messenger of the bad news, but that's just how the laws of nature work. Well, I, you don't have to feel bad because I, I totally reject that message. I, to me, it's, I guess, I, I, I see um, physics as being extremely powerful and useful in certain domains. But when it comes to the social and psychological domain you know which is the one that we all live in mainly um physics tells us very little so for example um physics doesn't do a good job of explaining what we might call progress in human history uh moral values any kind of value it doesn't explain beauty there are all sorts of things that have no um reference in the realm of physics. And so I guess I'm just, I think it's just, it's wrongheaded of, of physicists to claim that they have some kind of authority in these realms that are based on their interpretations of, you know, whether uh, the Schrodinger equation is or is not deterministic, whether physics as a whole is deterministic. That's, I, I actually just don't understand it because and I often have this feeling when I get in conversations about free will, it's, it's, it's as though we inhabit different worlds, but I think mainly you inhabit the world of a physicist. And I'm mainly in the world of psychology and values and politics. And st I don't know. Well, Just, it, everything is physics. You know, you're made of particles. The yeah. only way you can claim that there's something else to psychology is to deny that you're actually made of physical things. Mm -hmm. and, and that's this whole dualism thing, which I would just say is unscientific. If you want to believe it, you can believe it. I don't know what it's really good for. But your brain is made of particles, and we know the laws for those particles. 
So what you're implicitly claiming, and that's always what it comes uh, down to, is that somehow magically, if you put together a lot of those particles, boo, a miracle happens uh, and everything is different. And that's why I have free will, even though free will is incompatible with the fundamental laws of nature. And that's just magical thinking. You know, I'm, I, I have a hard time taking this seriously. Uh, I, I always have this impression that, you know, people who make an argument like this, they start from what they want to be true. Like, I mm -hmm. want it to be true that free will exists. Therefore, I have to reject everything we know about physics. Too bad for physicists. <laughs> well, I do want free will to be true. Uh, life to me is meaningless without it. But also, I believe in free will because I, I experience it. I ex I, I, there's evidence for it coming at me overwhelmingly every single day. Now, I, I just I want to refer to but something. If, so what's the evidence that where if you make one decision, what's the evidence that you have that you could have done something else? There's here, no such evidence. Here, here no, I, you I only ever do one thing. I totally believe in causation. I, I don't think that there are any, there's nothing I do that I could say is uncaused. I'm just saying that some of the causes are not, even though they're underpinned by physics, they're not physical causes. Um, one of the things that I do sometimes in, in arguments like this is I cite something that you cited and dismissed, which is uh, more is different. This famous essay by uh, Phil Anderson that came out in the seventies and um, you dismiss it, but I don't understand why you dismiss it. It seems to me that, that Anderson is saying something that again, is kind of self-evident that, Physics can explain a lot of things, but then there's some higher order phenomena, you know, like life and psychology, these, these sorts of things, um, social, social uh, behaviors that are not predictable. Um, well, they, they, they are predictable. That's the whole point. If you argue that they are not predictable, you're breaking something about what we already know to be true. And I would ask you, like, can you at least write down a hypothesis for how this can possibly happen? There isn't one. No one has any coherent theory for it. The only thing you can make it happen is to say, well, I, I just don't want to believe it. Okay, and, and that's where I start getting a problem. I mean, and, and, and I, I mean this seriously. Try to write it down. Try to write down any consistent theory in which you can have a layer of psychology, sociology, and so on, uh, which does not derive from the physics of the underlying constituents. And uh, I don't think it's possible, um, but at the very least, I can tell you that no one's managed to actually do it. Um, I'm looking for a phrase that you had. What's it? Uh, the principle of finite imagination. Yeah. Um, okay. I love that phrase. <laughs> and, um, and I think that that's kind of what we're talking about here. So I'm... Um, my basic argument is that physicists don't know nearly enough, scientists in general don't know nearly enough to rule out uh, free will at this point. And if, if they just abs say, you know, our, our equations are deterministic, therefore free will is impossible. Everything is determined by particles, you know, being pushed and pulled by various forces. They are just going beyond what their science can actually tell us about the world and they're suffering from a, you know, a deficit of uh, imagination. What I would do is point to um, the complete incoherence of, of theories of consciousness, like how you get consciousness out of matter. Um, and you talk about some of these, which are pretty crazy in your book, like uh, integrated information theory and, and panpsychism, uh, as a science journalist, I sort of stand back from all of them and say, they're all like just shots in the dark. Nobody really knows what they're talking about when they're talking about consciousness. Consciousness, of course, completely related to free will. And so if we have no coherent conception of how consciousness arises from matter, and I agree that it does somehow, 
but we don't know how at all, um, then it's like at, at the very least grossly premature to rule out free will. That's that's basically where well, I'm as, as I said, if you want to treat free will as an emergent concept, you can do this. That's the same that Rovelli Ro uh, does and, and what John Carroll does. Uh, and that's not inconsistent. I, I just don't really know what it's good for. It doesn't really change anything. Um, the, the future is still determined up to random events that uh, you cannot control. And that's something that physics can say something about, regardless of all the talk about psychology and uh, sociology and so on and so forth. That's what physics can actually say something about. And, uh, you know, you have to try to invent a way to, to make it all go away. Now, about this principle of finite uh, imagination, you can very well say, well, maybe that's just something that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that's all fine with me, because I always say, I can only tell you the status for all we currently know. And, and, and that's just what I'm saying. You know, for all we currently know, the future is determined up to random events that we can't influence. So may, maybe uh, two, three hundred years from now, um, that will change because we figure out something which we don't yet know. But at this current moment, uh, it doesn't look good for the idea that you can choose one of possible options. Okay. So I'm, I, I realize I'm not going to, uh, yeah, I'm not going to, change your mind, but I'm, you know, I just felt like I had to give you a little pushback there. Um, I want to go to uh, another really interesting discussion that you had um, in your book on, um, on creation stories. Uh, and, you know, this is obviously related to uh, um, religion uh, and spirituality. Um, so first of all, um, what about, like kind of old fashioned religious creation stories. Do you think science has ruled them out? I mean, like, you know, if the, the world is only 6,000 years old and God created it according to certain fundamentalist interpretations of the Bible. Um, has science ruled on those or do we have to be agnostic about them? It really depends on exactly what you mean. I mean, there are certain things that science has ruled out. Uh, it, it depends, for example, what do you mean by creation, uh, right? And so in this book, I try to make this point um, that, well, actually, actually, that there are two points. Um, one is that what we do in science is uh, we come up with simple explanations. And the problem with this creation story like there was some omniscient being called god who created all the dinosaurs in place di dinosaurs in bones in place or whatever th this story here looks like it's just hideously complicated right, right? If, if you say everything came out uh, of some plasma with, with small fluctuations and those collapsed under the pull of gravity and they formed galaxies and, and blah, 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 and evolution and so on and so forth. That is a much simpler story. And that makes it scientifically uh, a better explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you can say, well, but I still want to believe that God uh, made something. Uh, and, and I would say, well, if that doesn't conflict with evidence, uh, you're free to believe it. Uh, that's fine with me. And then I have this interview with uh, Tim Palmer, um, and, and he, I knew this, of course, be before we did the interview, but I wanted him uh, to, to explain this himself, uh, who points out that you can understand the, the creation of the universe as uh, breathing fire into the equations. Um, so it's basically, it's, it's an as scientific uh, event uh, that happens so that's his word which uh, i like so much that i carry it through the book <laughs> as opposed to unscientific uh, right. it's just something that science doesn't say anything about um because there we have in our theories no difference between uh an equation that has fire in it and one that doesn't we just use these equations to describe uh what we see 
And um, so w what I like about this is that it, it, it highlights that um, these creation myths, um, not only this, but also other ones, um, if you don't take them too literally, they're not so different from some of the things that we talk about uh, in physics today. Yeah, I, well, oh, okay, so can you just give us a little on that? Because I think some people might have the impression that um, physics has basically solved the problem of how the universe was was created. And you've got theories like inflation. Um, you've got the multiverse uh, theories. So can you just like give us your quick rundown on? Well, on well this, is, this is all unconfirmed. I, I mean, yeah. so inflation is, I think, one of the... Yeah, I, I, how would I, how, how do I put it? Most miscommunicated ideas, like it's uh, the 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 confidence that physicists put into it uh, vastly overstates how much we actually know. Right. Uh, and uh, when it comes to inflation, I mean, the basically the problem is. Um, we do have some observations from from the early universe, like uh, the cosmic microwave background uh, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, we're hoping to see gravitational waves uh, from the early universe at some point. These are the so-called primordial gravitational waves, but they're hard to detect, and we haven't actually yet done it. If we one day manage to detect them, that would actually allow us to look back before the creation of the CMB. Um, but either way... You put it, you know, that there, there is some time uh, in the early universe before which we don't have any observations. And so what do you do? Well, you can just take the theories that we have and just assume they remain valid and then you can run them back in time. And if you do this, you get uh, the Big Bang scenario. So, so you find that, uh, you know, there's just a singularity, which means that the equations break down and that's the end of the story. So it's it's rather uninspiring to some extent. And now physicists have tried to replace this um, naive extrapolation into the Big Bang with other theories. And uh, there are like dozens of them. And inflation is the currently most popular one, but it's certainly not the only one. Like there's, for example, um, uh, maybe the next famous one is Penrose's cyclic cosmology. Uh, but there are also other ones where you have... You know, you, you start with a with uh, basically a, a phase where there's no time at all. Like this is the, the idea with the no boundary uh, proposal. And um, there, there are other ideas like that. We um, it's, it's a little bit similar to the cyclic idea, but there's only one bounce. So there was a, a previous universe and then it bounces. And then now, now there's our universe, so no bang, but a bounce. Uh, and so on. And you can go through the list. There, there are just lots of them. And then the point is, if you look at the evidence that we have right now, you can't tell them apart. Right. So, so that's that's the that's the current status. And I think everyone who who makes a different claim uh, either didn't understand <laughs> the data uh, or they're just making things up. What's your feeling about whether? the origin of the universe is a solvable problem. Um, you know, that so we have the Big Bang Theory, but what led to the Big Bang? What, if anything, preceded the Big Bang? Uh, this was, the hope was that a unified theory of physics, if you go back to the, you know, some of the rhetoric of the 80s and 90s, coming from Stephen Hawking and Stephen Weinberg and people like that, the hope was that a unified theory might also tell us how the universe came to be and why it's this universe rather than some other universe. What's your feeling about whether that's a viable goal still? Well, the problem is that I think with the type of theory, which we currently use exactly what we've been talking about, you know, you have an initial state, you have an evolution law, and, and then maybe every once in a while you have an update of the wave function. Um, you, you just can't solve the problem because you always need an initial state. And then you can always ask, well, where did this initial state come from? Yeah. Right. Well, it came from an even earlier initial state. And where did this come from? So, so it's this chicken and egg problem. Yeah. And um, there might be other theories which don't need an initial condition, uh, but it, definitely the type of theory that we currently 
use won't do. And um, I, I actually think that David Deutsch's um, constructor theory, um, how it calls it, might be uh, a theory that can possibly achieve this. Um, it's somewhat unclear because the whole idea is somewhat unclear. <laughs> but uh, in, in principle, you know, he, he has this idea that um, you talk about the properties, um, the principles underlying uh, the laws. Um, and there, there are some other things that you can think of. Um, for example, it gets a little bit mathematical here, but the, the underlying problem is that all the theories that we currently use are based on differential equations. Mm -hmm. uh, so a certain type of equation that tells you um, how in small increments things change from one moment to the next or from one place uh, to the next. And that's not the only type of equation in existence. You know, there are lots of other ways that you can write down mathematics and uh, not all ways to formulate a structure for the universe need to be differential equations. It's just that, so it's an interesting question, why did we end up using differential equations? And I think it's because it corresponds to the way that we think about science. You know, we pre prepare something and then we look, what does it do? And that's basically what a differential equation tells you. So it's kind of a very natural thing to do, but that doesn't mean that's fundamentally how it really works, that it will always remain uh, so, some formulation of uh, differential equations it could just be something else. So um, to hopefully answer your question, uh, uh, I think it might be solvable, but but not with the kind of theory that we currently use. Um, all right. So you, you reminded me of there was another sort of big issue I wanted to bring up, uh, and I feel like. You know, this is kind of what I do. I look for contradictions, what I think are contradictions in other people's thinking. But here's another one that that I thought I spotted. You know, you were you're 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 really committed. I think your your deterministic outlook and and uh, your suspicion of free will comes from a commitment to certain kinds of mathematics that are deterministic, like differential equations. One of your great videos you talked about. You know, everything is describable by differential equations would, you know, would show things evolving instant by instant and so forth. But then you also have this discussion of the idea of whether reality is really math, right? And so, you know, Mac, Max Tegmark had what I think is a ridiculous book, The Mathematical Universe, I think it was called. And, uh, you know, it's kind of Platonism updated. Uh, and you just like demolished that and, I, and, you know, this is related to the principle of finite imagination. I think you're, you're saying, like, maybe there's entirely new math out there that we haven't thought of, uh, or maybe there are non-mathematical ways of describing reality. So who are we to say, you know, you're, you're basically saying it's premature to say that um, reality is mathematical, whatever that even means. Um, and I thought that was reflecting a kind of skepticism, agnosticism, whatever you want to call it, kind of an open-mindedness about possibilities being out there we haven't even imagined yet, that undercuts your commitment to determinism. Does that seem fair? Well, you know, I, I think you might overstate how strongly opinionated or committed I am uh, to one thing or another. So, um, you know, in this book, I, I really have two jobs. The one job is to say, this is what we know. And this is what we can conclude from what we've learned. And this is what the evidence says. And, and this is how we came to this conclusion and so on. Uh, and and then I, I, I also say, yeah, but look, there are some things we don't know, <laughs> right? Uh, and so some things could change here. And um, this issue with the question, like, is mathematics really the last word, so to say, on the question, how does nature work? This is something which I've thought about for, for a ridiculously long time. And I ended up writing an essay about it. Uh, which is called Beyond Math, um, which you find on the FQXI uh, website somewhere. And I came to the conclusion, no, you actually can do science, um, even if nature is not 
uh, mathematical. Mm. And, it, you know, to credit Tagmark, uh, it, it, his mathematical universe hypothesis got me thinking about it. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm of two minds about it. You know, the ones I I have to say, mathematics is great. I love mathematics. I originally studied mathematics, uh, and there's much more to discover, and there's fancier math. So just because there's something which we don't currently understand very well, like for example, consciousness, um, doesn't mean there's no math that can describe it. Maybe we just haven't found it. Uh, mathematics is a, is a big uh, realm. Um, on the other hand. Uh, you know, we've, we've only just begun trying to figure out how nature works. So God knows, maybe there's something better than mathematics, you know, something that's maybe more suitable to uh, describe consciousness or figure out how the universe began, um, or that kind of thing. I mean, it's certainly something that you can't just rule out from what, based on what do you want to rule it out, right? Um, yeah, David Bohm said, I interviewed him shortly before he died, and he Said, you know, he was sort of a peculiar visionary figure as well as a, you know, a really good physicist. And he, he said he thought that science might evolve away from mathematics and toward some other way of understanding reality. Um, so speaking of David Bohm, since I'm, I'm so obsessed with quantum mechanics right now, uh, what do you think about the end? There's, you know, a lot of people are obsessed with quantum mechanics now, uh, trying to figure out what it means. What's, and you discuss it in your book, um, in your usual, very clear, blunt way. So can you give us a quick overview of, of uh, your view of interpretations of quantum mechanics? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll still be talking in three hours or something uh, like that. Um, yeah, I mean, so to me, the interpretations of quantum mechanics are just different ways to look at the same math. Um, right. so from this mathematical point of view, it doesn't really make any difference, but that doesn't mean that interpretations are entirely uh, unnecessary because different ways to look at the math can actually help you to understand, uh, something different. And uh, I mean, there's, uh, the, to, to name the obvious things, uh, there's the Copenhagen interpretation. That's all this business with the spontaneous collapse of the wave function, uh, and then there's um, many words or the Everett uh, interpretation. Um, there is uh, Bohmian mechanics, um, which people argue about whether it's an interpretation. I would say it's an interpretation, uh, but sometimes people try to give me a hard time about it. And that, that would be a really long discussion, but, but I will insist it's an interpretation. And then there are things like... Um, spontaneous collapse models uh, right. like GRW and that kind of thing. And I would say those are not uh, interpretations. They're actually different theories because right. there's physically, there's something different happening. And also Penrose's idea that um, gravity induces the collapse of the wave function. So th these are actually um, modifications of quantum mechanics. So, so, so they would be uh, more fundamental theories. Uh, there are lots of other interpretations. I kind of feel like I've, I've, left out a few some <laughs> well, those are those are the big ones let, let me because we don't have much time left Korean history is that kind of stuff is kind of a many worldish idea um oh and then there's uh there's one called many minds oh and then there's oh, cubism yeah, many, cubism um, yeah that's, that's you know i've always struggled cubism is kind of a sex up version of the coke making interpretation so yeah um oh, and it's related to john wheeler's it from bit concept i guess here's my here's my the, the, the sort of deeper question I wanted to get at is will we understand, make sense of quantum mechanics someday, or will it yield to a deeper theory that gets rid of some of the, what we think of as paradoxes or the strangeness of the theory, it's, it's violation of common sense. I guess my deeper question is, is it too much to expect that reality will make sense to us someday? <laughs> well, I definitely think that quantum mechanics will be replaced by an underlying deeper theory. Mm. And uh, I think it will make more sense. <laughs> I, I think 
the major reason why people find quantum mechanics so hard to understand is that it's just internally inconsistent. And there are more and more people coming to the same conclusion. You know, there's there's actually been a lot going on in quantum foundations in, in the past years with, with all kinds of people putting out new theorems, uh, debating exactly what you have to give up to make sense of all this mess. And I hope that in the end, they'll just come to the conclusion, well, it's inconsistent. We need a better theory. Hmm. Um, so I think it, it can't be the last word. And it's, I mean, it's not a big th- secret that I think um, the right way to move forward is what's called super determinism. And I, I could talk to, about this for two hours, but we, we don't have that that amount of time. Um, basically, what it does for you is that it replaces this weird update of the wave function that uh, voila, now something happens and we don't know what it is uh, with uh, a gradual process um, mm-hmm. that actually results in a state, which is what we actually observe, which is what you want, want a theory to do, right? Yeah. Um, okay. I, I, well, I've got to admit, I my feeling, you know, I wrote this book 25 years ago called The End of Science. And the premise was, was that uh, science has done such a good job of describing the world that, you know, we're going to get sort of additions to knowledge, but nothing really dramatic, like, like quantum mechanics. And, you know, quantum mechanics is part of the foundation of physics. Now, I mean, I still I totally I'm more confused by quantum mechanics than ever, but it seems like like a house of cards. It seems very fragile. It seems like this kind of weird contraption that could be toppled at any moment. Um, although, you know, it's been around for a hundred years. Uh, but I, I I feel like there could be a revolution. And so I've actually changed my mind about the end of science. I feel like there could be a revolution uh, coming, or maybe there should be a revolution is what I'm saying. I definitely hope there will be a revolution coming. Um, and and also, if if that's correct, it will not remain interesting only for the foundations uh, of quantum mechanics, um, because, I mean, quantum mechanics is so, so important for modern technologies. Um, that would just propagate up the the whole ladder uh, in, in into all kinds of applications. Not immediately, <laughs> but eventually it will. Right. Um, okay. So yeah, we're we're out of time. I, I don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, but so I'll just say thank you. Love your book. Um, I look forward to it uh, actually being published. When when might that happen? Like next year sometime. Yeah, probably um, in the early summer, something like this. I don't yet have a publication date. I, yeah. I hope I'll, ha- I'll have a date soon. Okay. Well, congratulations. It's gonna, <laughs> you know, it's gonna get people arguing and, and talking <laughs> yeah, about yeah, it, yeah. And, which is which is what you want. 